The structure of a nucleus can be understood using a number of mathematical models, one of which is called the liquid drop model. The protons and neutrons are experiencing a strong nuclear force, which is a short-range force, up to a maximum of 2.5 fermions. Even that might be too large. We we'll have liquid molecules that are clinging to each other, basically. Let's show the molecules in the center will be pulled equally in all directions by the adjacent molecules, whereas the surface molecules will experience an unbalanced force. In this example, our atom has seven nucleons, four of which are protons. Therefore, we can check that and verify to be helium-7 with four protons and three neutrons. The mass of the nucleide is always less than the mass of the nucleons, and we can calculate the binding energy from the difference in masses multiplied by the square of the speed of light taking the total binding energy and dividing it by the number of nucleons, we get the binding energy per nucleon. Now when you take the binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts, and you plot that against the separation of the nucleons in femtometers, you get a very steep positive slope that pitches somewhere there around IM56. It dips slightly but remains in the region of 8 mega electron volts. The mass of any nucleate will be made up of the mass of the individual protons and neutrons plus the mass deficiency. We can use the famous Einstein equation equal to mc squared to rewrite that equation 1 as mass of the nucleate times c squared plus mass of protons times c squared plus mass of neutrons times c squared and the energy deficiency times c squared where that energy deficiency has been shown to be the binding energy. Hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus, so we can basically just rewrite the equation above using the hydrogen atom. Recording that a nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and uh, that the strong nuclear force can act between the protons and protons, neutrons and protons, or neutrons and neutrons in the same manner. The volume interactions is given by that formula. And if you choose A equal to 3 just to test it, indeed we get the three interactions as shown. And then we can choose all nucleons and we get six interactions. So that we can conclude that the binding energy is directly proportional to the square of the nucleons. And the binding energy per nucleon will be given by a constant AV multiplied by the number of neutrons. So volume interactions are given by this expression in the binding energy formula. Surface nucleons are not experiencing forces all around them as those that are in the center. And this will reduce the binding energy. We know that the area of a sphere is given by 4 pi r squared, where r can be replaced by the radius of a nucleus. Therefore, we can establish that the binding energy per nucleon will be directly proportional to the square of the cube root of the number of nucleons. And therefore, this will give us the second term of the binding energy formula, which is negative as it reduces the binding energy and it corrects the surface interactions. Protons will repel each other according to Coulomb's law F equal to K E squared over R squared. Energy will be given by K E squared over R, where R can be the radius of a nucleus. And since there are Z squared minus Z over two proton-proton pairs, we find that the binding energy per nucleon is directly proportional to z squared minus z over 2a to the power 1 over 3. And that will be the third term of the binding energy expression, which corrects for the Coulomb interactions. Extra neutrons in the nucleus create an asymmetry, which has a tendency to reduce the binding energy. And 
this is prevalent for nuclei that are above A equal to 20. Let's pack protons and neutrons on the energy levels according to the Pauli exclusion principle. We know that four nucleons can occupy the same energy state and once you run out of protons, taking the remaining extra neutrons creates an asymmetry. The binding energy per nucleon is directly proportional to the square of the difference between protons and neutrons divided by the number of nucleons. And this gives us the fourth term in the binding energy expression which corrects for the asymmetry that is produced by excess neutrons in a nucleus. A nucleus can have odd-odd, even-odd, or even-even protons and neutrons, or neutrons and protons. What if we had an odd-odd pair? It always generates a negative effect to the binding energy. The odd-odd becomes negative simply because you always have one unpaired neutron and one unpaired proton, which are less tightly bound, hence radioactive decay may occur. The even odd cancels out, whereas the even even will always have protons pairing and neutrons pairing to each other. So it is because of the unpaired neutrons and protons that you get the lower binding energy per nucleon which is our last term in the binding energy expression. So we can combine um, this equation, which is of the binding energy equation three, with equation two, uh, to get what we refer to as the semi-empirical mass formula. Let's look at the NZ plot, or the ZN plot, as it's shown here. And I've already explained that um, for A less than or equal to 20, meaning smaller nuclei, you often find that the atoms are more stable when N is equal to Z, protons equal to neutrons. And the minute you increase the number of nucleons to above 20, you start getting some radioactive decay uh, where some protons turn into neutrons plus electron neutrino or neutrons can also turn into protons plus electron and then anti-electron neutrino and this is uh, when you get beta decay. Now when you increase this further, say above 82 nucleons, then you start shedding off some mass through alpha decay. And we've already said that an alpha decay is basically just a helium atom. The mass will be in a form A plus B times Z plus C times Z squared. This is a form of a parabola. If we plot the graph of mass as a function of the number of protons for nuclei with odd nuclides, then you get a parabola like that, where unstable nuclei will undergo radioactive decay and others may not even exist. And for even nuclei, you get two plots. The top one is for odd odd nuclei and the bottom one is for even even nuclei. And again, you get a number of radioactive decay for the unstable nucleus that can go to more stable form through radioactivity. You can find the number of protons that can sustain the stability of a nucleus using this equation, Z equal to A over two multiplied by one over one plus 0 0.008 and the square of the cube root of the nucleus. Now, when you take an example, a equal to 4, there could be a number of combinations. Now, question is, which of these would be stable? You can use this formula by substituting 4 for A, and you will find that the number of protons come to 1.96, 2 protons, and 2 neutrons. Now, let's look at the nuclear reactions and how they are achieved.
Nuclear reactions are more like loading a gun with electrons, protons, and neutrons and targeting a nucleus. The wavelength must be within femtometers. Now we can plot the nuclear potential as a function of radius or neutron neutron or neutron proton pairs, and you get something like that. And for proton proton pairs, you get a little hump on the right due to the Coulomb interaction of protons. The nucleons cannot come too close to each other, hence there's a repulsive force, very close distances, and an attractive force in the region of a strong nuclear force. So now let's close today's lesson by looking at the characteristics of a strong nuclear force that we've learned so far. The effect between protons and protons, neutrons and protons, neutrons and neutrons in the same manner. And the nucleons interact strongly only with their nearest neighbors. We've learned that the strong nuclear force is at least a hundred times more than the Coulombic force. And we also say that it is spin dependent. 